Thank you all for being here. I'm Stephanie Frita. I'm Special Projects Manager here at the Neiman Foundation. Um, and I wanted to first, and now she's almost leaving, I want you to acknowledge Christine Kay, who has been in charge of this event for our events team. She's making sure your blood sugar levels are up to the task of what, <laughs> the kind of thinking we're having today. I wanted all of us to give an applause to Christine Kay. Thank you. And then, of course, there's a whole team involved in making this happen today, especially as the Neiman Foundation is entering the future with our live stream. Hi to everybody who's watching, of course. Um, there's Kevin and Charles here. There's Barbara McCarthy upstairs, our web designer. Um, there's Jonathan here who's live tweeting uh, or live blogging the events who cover it live. So there's all kinds of ways that we're trying to let other people participate, which is quite exciting and new for us. Um, Turn my notes around. So, this is the panel on press freedom as a human right. If you've been glued to the news stream, and that was half a joke for the lingo on the human rights, but I think it's, um, <laughs> the people are looking at me. So, um, if you've been glued to the news stream on WikiLeaks the way I have in these past couple of weeks, um, you've been reading The Guardian New York Times, obviously. You've probably followed Greg Mitchell's blog. You've been tweeting. Um, you may have seen Daniel Ellsberg chat with um, Stephen Colbert. Or you may have seen Julian Assange intercept a message by President Obama on Saturday Night Live. Um, since the rollout of the cables, we've been so man seen so many ideas being tossed around. Um, but there was one day last week, I thought, when things changed. And that was the day when Senator Lieberman tipped the tide on questions about transparency and press freedom that had been bubbling beneath the surface until then. Sure, Mike Huckabee had previously announced he'd like to see someone responsible for this WikiLeaks mess executed, and others were pushing the Assange as a terrorist narrative. But Lieberman did something else. He went after the New York Times. Shouldn't they be investigated by the Justice Department for what they did, he wondered? The question spread through the blogosphere fast on that day, and as we all know, Lieberman and a few others also began to use their business connections to try to dry out WikiLeaks' online contributions. From what I saw, it was Glenn Greenwald, and I think he's going to be mentioned here a lot today because he's been such an important voice in the discussion. But Glenn at Salong was the first one who asked, what if they had decided to go to the people who print the New York Times and ask them not to print tomorrow's paper. Was that the equivalent of what was happening to WikiLeaks? That would have been an outcry, of course, the New York Times. You know, they'd asked the people not to print the New York Times. Um, and I thought on that day the discussion was changing, at least for me, and I realize I'm of a younger generation than Kathleen. It was in an unsettling way. It showed, showcased that we cannot take press freedom for granted even here in the United States or in Germany where I'm from, and that we have to constantly negotiate that again, and that we have to make sure people still get what it is all about when the names and the institutions change. <clears throat> and this is why I think we see all kinds of journalists starting to speak up now for WikiLeaks, even though, as God knows, um, there's been a lot of criticism in the journalism community. It's this kind of, oh, sorry. <coughs> God, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, by prosecuting WikiLeaks staff, a letter signed by 20 Columbia Journalism School professors just this week explained to Obama that would set a dangerous precedent. It's this kind of repression, being threatened, prosecuted, and sometimes <coughs> jailed for pure acts of journalism that Kathleen was obviously also talking about that our four speakers today know all too well. Where they work in Romania, Chile, South Africa, and Cambodia, comments like those made by Senators Lieberman and Feinstein are abundant and don't create much of an echo. These four are here today to remind us that the fight for press freedom is a global one. They all have a story to tell about how new media tools, including WikiLeaks, have enabled them to circumvent censorship and uncover corruption. And they are vivid examples of the kind of courage that it takes to investigate abusive government, corrupt businessmen, drug dealers, and the like. Take Stefan Candea, our first speaker today, co-founder of the Romanian Center for Investigative Journalism and a current Neiman Fellow. He just shrugs when you ask him 
what it was like to investigate connections between the Romanian president's associates and the mafia organization La Cosa Nostra. We're lucky in Romania, he'll tell you. They just threaten you or take you to court. And by that he means it's not like Russia or Mexico or Pakistan where journalists get killed. Or take Alejandra Matus, who has written about politics and law in Chile and Latin America for more than 20 years. She will tell us a bit, or she can tell us a bit about the national security argument. In 1999, her black book <coughs> of Chilean justice was banned under the provisions of the Chilean national security law, and she had to flee the country. Her battle for freedom of expression contributed to a reform law, and she could return to Chile in 2001, but the fight for transparency was far from over. We'll also hear from Rob Rose, who heads up the business investigations unit at the Sunday Times, South Africa's most widely read newspaper. On the day he left for his Neiman Fellowship, his office was raided and his colleague arrested. The crime, the two reporters had published undisclosed contracts between South African government entities and football's governing body, FIFA, and revealed shady deals struck by FIFA with its suppliers. Last but not least, Kevin Doyle will take us to Cambodia, where he's editor-in-chief of the Cambodia Daily. Now, his paper is the first English-language newspaper in Cambodia, a country where most of the press is controlled by government and where, like Kevin, you can get arrested for publishing comments made by opposition members. When I asked Kevin if he would join us today to talk about how he trains young journalists to investigate corruption and drug trafficking, and subjects like that, and how his paper is being threatened and its journalists jailed, he looked at me and in his perfectly Irish way said, well, you think that'd be interesting? It's just what we do, isn't it? So let's talk about what we do. And we're gonna, the way we're gonna run the panels today, each speaker is gonna talk for 10 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So let's hear from Stefan first. Okay. Hi, I'm Stefan Candeas. Uh, you heard I'm here to speak uh, about my or our center for investigative journalism in, back in Romania, a media NGO that we created, me and uh, two other colleagues we created back in 2001. And we started working with this center more actively after we had to quit our newspaper, a leading paper back then co-owned by uh, German, uh, German Bertelsmann, but also by a Romanian owner who was very involved not only into the business as a publisher, but also in writing uh, daily editorials, in deciding o over advertisement uh, publishing, in deciding, deciding what gets in the paper and what stays out, and so on. <coughs> um, I'll talk a, a bit how we are working and how we are um, trying <coughs> constantly to find uh, ways to get the information, um, how we try to learn um, how to package this information and to publish the information because we are publishing online and we are publishing uh, with uh, partners in the mainstream media in Romania and in the region. And I'll talk a bit on how we struggle to finance all this, um, which is a very challenging and interesting work uh, to do in my region. So I'll go a little bit through the general frame, uh, how it's to work in a country that spent 50 years under communism, um, and um, what happens to, to journalists who do investigative stories or write or co cover corruption, or write about uh, really important people, politicians or business people, uh, multinational companies. That's not such a big uh, issue because uh, you know we have uh, 20 years new democracy and. Well, um, big corporations just start to build. Now, when you write about a very uh, big business, you are dealing with uh, very important men behind that business. So we call them those oligarchs in the region. Um, I'll try to talk a, a little bit um, about our, my center reaction to the media landscape in Romania. It's a, all these seven, eight years I've been uh, working with my, my center was a um, uh, learning process, process and it, it's still a learning process. Um, we are in a continuous crisis. Uh, we are choking for lack of money, but that 
makes us alert and uh, uh, innovative. Um, we face forever, like for the last 20 years in Romania, we face um, <coughs> problems that media in the US and Western Europe just now start to realize that they exist. Um, and I think on the long run, we, um, we are winning because we are trying, we are succeeding to build credibility and a network of journalists who respect some ethics and who are honest journalists. Looking back to our work in the region and in Romania, we managed to create a sort of backbone of uh, uh, journalists who are uh, behind all investigative <coughs> related initiatives in the region. So a little bit about the, the general frame I work in. Uh, as you know, Romania <coughs> was under communist rule until 89. And that was, uh, I was living on, in a state, although I was uh, uh, 11 when uh, the, the communist state collapsed, I still remember um, how it was to live under this state who knew everything about its citizen, um, who managed to make people spy on each other, and uh, how it was to live in a state that you knew nothing about your rulers, um, except from rumors. Um, along with this, uh, huge control from the state and from a dictatorship uh, came a lot of corruption, which during the communist time was coordinated by the Secret Service. We c uh, it was called the Securitate. And it was coordinated on behalf of a nomenclatura um, that was under direct supervision of a dictator. And well, this Securitate and the former nomenclatura at some point took over the power, killed the dictator, and we've got a democracy. But um, 20, 20 years after, as far as I know, out of the 50,000 Securitate agents who were uh, doing this uh, political police, uh, we know the identities of only 3% of those people. And out of 400,000 Securitate informants, we know the identity of less than 1%. Out of these people, out of these 50,000 agents and 400,000 uh, informants, um, comes today's elite in Romania. So parliamentarians, MPs, judges, prosecutors, business people, and media owners. Media, of course, was during these 50 years just a propaganda tool. It was, a, it was part of the, the communist uh, party. Oh, I just told that I have five minutes left. It was <laughs> just part of the communist party. Um, and so, <coughs> You have to understand this background to understand who is uh, uh, in the media business today. Um, we were told uh, by uh, Chief Justice from the Supreme Court here in Massachusetts that, um, in her opinion, a functional democracy has to have a free ballot, independent judges, and a free media. We have neither of those in Romania. Uh, we have uh, a lot of frauds and buying votes uh, when we talk about ballots. Judges, most of them are connected to financial or political interest. There is a huge distrust of the uh, justice system. Or if they are in important positions, they might be blackmailed, uh, blackmailed with their past. Um, the media, except the online media, I don't think that our traditional media is free because it's owned by local oligarchs <coughs> whose main source of income uh, is dealing with the state, with public money. And their only goal to, uh, well, their only motivation to own media is to stay out of jail and to be able to name politicians in uh, different positions. We had, um, after the Orion Curtain collapsed, we had two existing models to look at, like in the uh, successful bis uh, media models. We were looking at uh, Berlusconi media the, in terms of ownership, and we were looking at Murdoch. Uh, media in terms of con content and it was getting better in time so now if you are zapping uh, Romanian TV you will see a lot of variation of Fox News media um, all over the place that's a simple expli explanation people who built media in, in these 20 years were either uh, entrepreneurs new entrepreneurs or journalists who used to work for the communist propaga propaganda and none of them were interested in ethics or quality journalism some of them became par part of the elite, dealing uh, uh, 
directly with politicians, trying to advise politicians, doing lobby and so on, but still staying in the media. Um, we just had access to what one of our main media owner uh, was discussing uh, with his uh, media managers because this media owner was involved in a, is involved in a criminal trial. So the, uh, his uh, phones were taped by the prosecutor and we, ha we could read these leaked documents. So he was instructing his uh, top management for this huge media empire that he wants his media empire to work like his Audi limousine. So when he turns the key on the right, it has to start. When he turns the key on the left, it has to stop. And the, his media should work like that. Uh, if he wants to attack the president, it should attack the president. If he wants to stop the attacks, it should stop. Um, I won't bother you too much with our local uh, uh, frame uh, I mean, the legislation and the problems we have with prosecutors and judges, you may imagine from what I said, um, we have a sort of FOIA uh, uh, legislation. It's um, local legislation adopted but not implemented. So journalists who really want to use this legislation have to educate the public clerks that this legislation <laughs> exists. Uh, a lot of times, most of the times, they are refused the information. Journalists have to go to court to uh, sue those people who are uh, refusing to deliver the information. And the court trial in Romania lasts about five years, maybe 10. Um, and journalists have to go alone uh, to court. They don't have the backup of their, their newsroom. Um, leak, leaked documents like WikiLeaks are a very important source uh, of information. Actually, documents that are available outside the country are a very important source of uh, of information because our local politicians assume that if they control the information in Romania uh, you cannot get this information which is wrong. There are a lot of ways to have access to databases outside the country um, or to uh, documents uh, documents uh, compiled by the foreign politicians about our country. Um, I was saying that journalists are part of the problem in, in uh, my country. Uh, because they get corrupt, because they tend to uh, side with the establishment and they want to be part of the establishment. Um, there is a huge distrust in, in mainstream media, if you ask me, and there is a reason to that. A lot of information that was uh, given uh, to journalists was misused um, for advertisement racketeering. Um, of course, we have, <coughs> we have a lot of taboo topics um, and but there are ways to uh, avoid this by publishing online. And eventually, if there is a taboo topic that was refused for publication in the mainstream media, you publish this online, at some point it will uh, make his way uh, to the mainstream media, not immediately. There is, um, there is pressure from prosecutors or judges on, on journalism. There is pressure from politicians. And it's like every week you have a new politician <coughs> thinking to adopt a new piece of legislation that will keep journalists uh, quiet. So you have to understand that uh, to work as, a journal, as an investigative journalist in this media center, uh, we, have also, we, we cannot um, ignore the media landscape. We have to do some advocacy work. And we have to monitor the, um, the legislation. And we have to react on abuses. Um, there is a new trend in Eastern Europe. If you publish uh, an investigative story about a really big important uh, oligarch that has a lot of money, he will sue you. Uh, he will not sue you in your country. He will sue you in London uh, because oligarchs love UK courts now. And there is another. Uh, there is a response to that. Some websites uh, deny access for UK visitors to their websites so that, so that they cannot be brought to court in the UK anymore. Um, so there is, there is this pressure that I, I consider normal until you know, your journalists don't get killed. Um, and it would be bearable if you have support in your newsroom, which doesn't happen. Um, s when we were working in a newsroom, we faced all kind of really strange situation, like journalists spying, colleague journalists spying on us. Um, on behalf of companies, on behalf of business people, or on behalf of the government. But I think about this topic, there is a, another Neiman fellow who can speak more uh, 
Holman Morris about the uh, uh, government spying on journalists. Um, there is, I faced a really strange situation when a uh, colleague journalist hacked into our computers and uh, stole the uh, images we gathered or the information we gathered about to be published and sold this information to our to the target of our investigation. Um, we would expect support from your editors and from your from the owner of the media, but that doesn't happen. Actually, the biggest pressures come from them because they get into shelly deals with uh, our target of investigations. So um, <coughs> we try to since since we started this, this work, we try to um, gather as much documents as we can. We try to gather as much databases as we can. We don't refuse access to any kind of database, whether it's a it's a hacked database or not, because we have so less so uh, less sources of information. Um, there is a huge um, okay. There is a huge uh, difference in uh, how how it was possible to work in back in ninety nine when I started to work. And now, um, starting in my newspaper back then, we had no access to computers. We only had typewriters. We couldn't, ha we, we had no access to the Register of Commerce, for example. I had to bribe clerks to uh, give us company records. Now everything is online. Now you have access to your computer. And actually, most of our work we do at our center is not in a newsroom. It's from each people home. Um, so I was told to wrap up now. Um, I will get into more details when we get to the questions, uh, question and answers. Yep. Thanks. Hi, uh, it's good to be surrounded to journalists that do the same thing because uh, this uh, work of investigative journalism sometimes became uh, lonely, and I have had the experience of just writing a story on technology, something to survive the month. And I uh, call somebody and they say, why? Why are you asking me these questions? What are you up to? <laughs> so <laughs> it's good to know that uh, we are not alone. Um, um, <clears throat> journalism, investigative journalism, um, the definition we use, at, at least in Latin America, is to find something that someone with power does not want to people to know. And that has been done um, from a long time. Um, and I think Watergate is uh, our kind of you know, uh, uh, main uh, moment. But I think it's been done since journalism and communication is uh, around. It's try to find out what people with power in our lives or in the citizens' life are doing. Um, and um, uh, before technology, we did that with just uh, trying to find the secrets in pieces of papers of, or, 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 or just talking to people. And that's what I did with the uh, uh, Black Book of uh, Chilean Justice. Um, uh, it seemed, uh, 1999, it seemed a long time ago because there was uh, the World Wide Web, it was not interconnected as it is today. And um, I found myself reporting in the courts where um, everything was secret. Was secret um, the testimonies that were gathered, the decisions the judges uh, took on cases, how they arrived to those decisions. And what reporters did at that time, most of the time, was just to um, inform the public when the decision was taken. This person was condemned, this person was uh, uh, found uh, innocent, and that was uh, the business. Covering the courts was like um, uh, covering the less important issue of uh, journalism. Nobody wanted to go there. It was dry, boring, and it didn't uh, produce too much headlines. It was crimes, crashes, and stuff like that. Um, but Chile um, uh, recovered democracy in 1990, and the human rights violations and uh, all the uh, possibilities of uncovering what happened during the dictatorship uh, was a responsibility given to these courts. 
um, I don't think Americans would never could never imagine this because there was a, it, it's a different system of uh, judiciary uh, that comes from the uh, Spanish crown times uh, where the courts were not supposed to put in balance accused uh, and uh, defender but uh, 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 the weight was put on accusing it's, uh, it was um, uh, you were presumed guilty before <laughs> you were presumed innocent uh, you had to prove your innocence uh, and uh, of course that was difficult if you had no power and um, it was difficult without jurors and it was difficult without press uh, so uh, there I was a uh, uh, little more than 20 years old um, starting to work as a journalist and trying to understand this court and trying to apply the lessons that I learned in school that we were supposed to uh, make sense and, 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 and report the relevant issues to the uh, Chilean public. So I started, to co started from covering the human rights issues. I started to wonder, well, how these decisions are made. How is this possible that these crimes are not being uh, processed? But um, there were other decisions that were um, also uh, challenging, like uh, why are they releasing these uh, drug traffickers? Uh, why is this, this businessman uh, meeting with this uh, Supreme Court judge um, outside work hours when he's, um, uh, when one of his cases is being decided by the same, this judge? And I started writing stories uh, uh, about that uh, with the help of my newspaper. Uh, at that moment, we had uh, more newspapers than we have now. And um, from that moment, um, um, a publisher get interested on, on, on writing a book about this issue, about the judiciary role. And I um, um, accepted the challenge of doing it. And um, as... Um, Kathleen said, journalism uh, most of the time is boring, and investigative journalism is more boring. <laughs> 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 because um, it took me six years of my life to stay in those courts and talk to people and gain their confidence. And some of them give me some little pieces of documents, and some of them, most of them, give me information. But that was, that was not the type of information that will, you will leak to WikiLeaks. It's not in any record. And it's not uh, possible to gather either as the, you know, using the tools of Freedom uh, Act or any, any other uh, tools that journalists can have at <coughs> hand because people are not going to voluntarily give you information that could make them lose their jobs or that could, uh, 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 could give them no benefit. But the ethical, the ethical benefit of knowing that society might know something that is important. And it's, uh, I, I always uh, um, uh, got impressed by the courage of those people. Because for me, it was my work. I was doing my work. I was doing what I was supposed to do. But they could live very safely and uh, without providing me any information and, and without feeling that they were doing something wrong. Uh, but during those six years, a lot of people um, uh, took the, the risk of talking to me and giving me information. And I found out that that was not enough to write a book. It was not enough to know what's going on. You need to know why it should be different. And to know why it should be different, you also need to know the principles of democracy, what a, what a judiciary is supposed to be doing, what society expects of that judiciary, and what is the other countries are doing, and where, uh, uh, what country is doing it right. And that is a study. That's not um, using a hiding camera or, 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 or trying to get that document. That's the uh, main simple uh, work of uh, studying and maybe talking to a um, historian, a uh, social scientist. And all of that, uh, that's what, uh, in my point of view, makes a journalist. It's not just getting that secret out. 
is put it in context, is given it uh, meaning, and it um, uh, put it in a language that people could understand. Because that's the other uh, challenge. There was a lot of people when I was doing my work that they said, why are you doing this? They, everybody knows. By everybody, they mean them, the experts or, 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 or the lawyers. And even I, after I published my book and I was persecuted and all that, that still people say, why? Why was it big, and, uh, uh, big deal? We know more than you published. And of course they do. The people that is involved in the system knew a lot more than, uh, than when I published. But what I published was what could I, uh, could I defend, that I could uh, provide information. If anybody else took the challenge of doing what I did, I could show them how to do it, where to go, what, what are the traces of the information that I gathered that anybody could gather by themselves and arrive to the same conclusion or to something different. But it, it was traceable. It's not uh, a gossip. It's not something that uh, I could not uh, sustain. And I think that was the, uh, the problem with the book. It was, uh, it was not that the, uh, um, that the book uh, revealed just one secret or the wrongdoing of one person, because that's very easy to control. You can put a person separated from the system, or, 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 or you can block the access to the information. Uh, the problem with the book was that it's put in context a system, a whole system, the whole judiciary that wasn't working. It, uh, part of the job was getting the secrets. Part of the job was um, talking to people and, and, and make them uh, reveal information. Part of the job was getting documents. But it's not what, uh, it's not what uh, journalists do. We, we just ga gather that information and put it in context. And I think that's, uh, uh, um, there is some hysteria around journalists. We feel threatened by what WikiLeaks is doing. And I feel, I have uh, seen a lot of corporative defense, like saying, no, that's not real journalism. We are the real journalists. Uh, he shouldn't do that. that. Or, uh, um, I think uh, the most um, uh, meaningful part of this is that he had to give the information to journalists to process it and to write it. Uh, uh, there is enough investigation now in, in psychology that human beings can only process certain amount of information. We are not uh, made to read uh, thousands of documents and understand what is important, what is not. That's why there is journalists and to do the boring part of reading, understanding, making sense, and um, publishing. So I, I think, uh, um, uh, as uh, Stefan says, uh, for us in Latin America or many other uh, countries, the existence of WikiLeaks and outside our countries uh, 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 databases are, are very important because they are, are uh, sources of information. Um, but I think that's not um, the main threat to journalism. The main threat to journalism uh, is the sustainability of what we're doing. Who is going to pay our salary? Who is going to pay uh, professionals to study, to go uh, read uh, uh, boring documents and to make sense out of it, and to give it to the public? And that's, uh, uh, that's the challenge we have uh, not seen so far how to solve in the digital era. And uh, I don't think even WikiLeaks have solved it. So um, I think we, Thank we you can so continue. Much. Yeah. Hi. Um, in the first 20 minutes, I'll give an overview of the structure of media. Yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> OK, I won't do that. I've seen the, the signs every couple of minutes saying you have five minutes left as you start speaking. Um, <laughs> So I, I write primarily about the nexus between business and politics in South Africa. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a country that has quite a, quite a vibrant watchdog press that, that emerged through the apartheid era. Um, I, there were a lot of newspapers and magazines that challenged the government at the time. So, and, and the government had a sense of the importance of media challenging government, which helped us in the post-independence post stage after apartheid to uh, put the primacy of information freedom and uh, freedom of information to the, to the forefront. So in Africa, you've seen, um, you've seen about 14 countries, I think, uh, led, I mean, I suppose South Africa is obviously part of it, um, putting in place access to information laws, which is a crucial step um, in terms of this sort of thing. I think the problem has been in, 
in, um, in implementing those, those access to information laws, as you see all over the world. You can have the laws, but it can just be a, you know, the form, not the substance. For example, this week, the South African government was finally forced after eight years to release, the, um, to release a, a judge's report into the Zimbabwe election in 2002, which is eight years after it happened, um, amid widespread talk of a rigged election. So, I mean, that's, that's an indication of the fact that, that the freedom of access to information laws exist, but they're often very difficult to implement and often hold back um, journalists' work. In a lot of countries, it's one thing to have, the, have the, um, the actual form, but it's another thing to have the substance. Um, and many of the countries around Africa, the journalists and sources do get taken out. They get killed, and not, not for dinner or anything, but in a far more, you know, bad way. I mean, we've had um, Carlos Cardoso, a Mozambican journalist who was investigating bank fraud in Mozambique um, involving the president's son, simply shot outside a hotel one morning. In South Africa, recently the World Cup was held in South Africa this year, and um, it's a huge money-spinning event, um, and it involves lots of money for people who are willing to get tenders, who want to get tenders from government and from FIFA, the, the governing body, to build stadiums, to provide services for the event. Um, and in one province in South Africa, there was a hit squad actually assembled to take out journalists who were critical of these contracts, who were looking at, looking at how these contracts were awarded, and take out certain business opponents of other people who wished to have a slice of the, of the pie. <coughs> two, um, two, two incidents I wanted to talk about. W one is a kind of a corporate, corporate incident that, that I think illustrates how uh, WikiLeaks or organizations like WikiLeaks can, can actually help us. Um, in, in my country, the banking system evolved to serve the needs of the white, white minority during the apartheid era. Um, it's a very sophisticated banking system, but as a consequence, 37% of people in the country, adults over the age of 16, don't have bank accounts. Um, and that's primarily because of the high, high fees, high prices that the banks charge, which lock a lot of people out of the system. I think about half the people in the country have ATM cards. So access to cash and access to banks is a huge issue. Um, 2007, there was, a, there was a panel convened to look at, to investigate high bank fees, to investigate the blockages that exist um, in the banking sector. Um, and they released a report, quite a damning report as it turned out, but huge sections of it were excised, were censored completely, big black, black splodges across the pages. So you had no idea what the findings of the panel actually were. Um, then a company called uh, WikiLeaks came out and they actually managed to get the uncensored version um, of the entire bank report, which proved that the banks were which proved that the panel itself, the, the independent panel, had excised huge portions of their own findings as a result of the bank's sensitivity. In that case, we, we, we were able to get the report and report on that, and, and that actually helped push reforms in the banking sector and helped accelerate the changes, and it, uh, well, obviously severely embarrassed the panel and the government who were involved. Um, but it actually, I mean, the, the purpose of it was, the point is that it, it accelerated change in the banking system um, in terms of fees, which was, I mean, I thought pretty crucial at the time. <laughs> the second case involved the World Cup. I mean, it's a, it's a huge event. It's organized by FIFA, this governing, governing body. Um, it's it's not, not so popular amongst Americans, but, but um, 715 or so million people watched the final across the world, so it's, a, it's quite a big event. And as I said before, the contracts to build this event um, are very lucrative. I think about $6 billion was spent building new stadiums, just on building new stadiums in the country. So that's a lot of money that's that can go to the right people with the right connections. Um, effectively, FIFA refused to release any of the contracts um, around this, and the second government were equally reluctant to disclose where the money was going, how it was going. We asked for it, we were met with a, with a polite hand saying, no thanks. Um, and so some of the newspapers used the access to information laws to go to, to court to compel the release of information. Um, and that process is still going on. There was an early victory for the Mail and Guardian newspaper, um, but that is still going on. It's, it's still in the process. Companies love to appeal things. I, it's, I don't know why. Um, <coughs> but we got, we got a compact disc CD leaked to us, which contained details of huge amount of contracts involving Johannesburg, the city that hosted the final and the, and the opening game of the World Cup. Um, and this showed, for example, that despite the fact that government was was promising huge returns to the citizens for investing six billion dollars of their own money in this, that all the money effectively that FIFA was giving the Johannesburg Stadium, the Johannesburg City, was going to a separate third company. Um, and that was never disclosed by the company. Citizens had no idea that, that the cash was going to be 
was going to be handed off to a third company for some bizarre reason. Um, and that wouldn't have come out unless we got leaked that, those documents. Um, as part of that, there's a principle in South Africa of black economic empowerment, which, um, which effectively seeks to transfer assets from the white minority to previously disempowered black people. So effectively, 25% of many companies are have or should be transferred across, and most companies try and comply, the, comply with this. But as with any large asset transfers, you get a lot of corruption. I think as you saw in Eastern Europe, you had a lot of, you know, in the post-communist era, you had assets being transferred and huge amounts of corruption in how that was transferred. So in this case, the contracts also helps us to see that some of the comp that third-party company who got the World Cup contracts had a 25% black empowerment shareholder who I was able to trace to a guy living in a shack in a completely poor neighborhood who had no idea he actually owned the shares. Um, so that's, that's a case of, you know, we wouldn't have found that out. And FIFA and the government certainly weren't keen to let us see that information. But that's crucial, crucially in the public interest. And then just a few thoughts on, um, on the factors shaping, I suppose, my country and, uh, well, I've got two minutes, um, shaping my country and, uh, and pro you know, the continent to an extent. Um, I think a lot of countries are struggling with the fact that you either have a watchdog media that kind of, you know, does exactly this kind of thing, ferrets out secrets, or you have a nation-building media um, that kind of seeks to support it, like you have in China, you know, looking for harmony, looking to support the state. Um, and I think what hasn't helped is that countries like China have seen huge economic success, huge success in without having a free press, um, which has vindicated a lot of African countries, I think, that are seeking to, re to repeal the successes to repeal the freedoms. Um, China's a huge trading partner of Africa and many countries now, and, uh, and they've used the success of China as vindication for repealing or seeking to repeal certain press laws. Um, in South Africa, for example, there's been talk of um, a media tribunal. There's a new Information Act, which effectively will give, give government pre-publication censorship rights. Um, and that's clearly not a, not a very good thing. My, like Stephanie said, my colleague was arrested the day I left. Um, for reporting about the World Cup contracts. He was effectively um, taken off to a prison cell and, um, and, and he was arrested at my building while we were having a discussion on media freedoms and how to react to this, this new, this new um, assault on media freedom. So, um, and the third factor I think is important is, is exactly the international, the international context and the way the world reacts has a huge impression on the way countries react further down the line, my country, my continent, like the China example. So I think the way the world reacts to, to WikiLeaks and the, the corporate toadying of, of Amazon and MasterCard will create an expectation that our companies will fold just as easily. And I think that's quite a dangerous, a dangerous slippery slope for, for other countries. That's not just America's problem. And that's what I have to say. Indeed, yeah. yeah hard act to follow with everyone. Uh, good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to, uh, to, to speak to you a little bit about my work in Cambodia and to speak about Cambodia. Um, as Stephanie uh, has mentioned, my name is Kevin Doyle. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Cambodia Daily Newspaper in Phnom Penh. The newspaper was established in 1993 as a not-for-profit entity uh, with the, the duty or the, the focus on training a new generation of Cambodian journalists and uh, to bring the best of impartial news to, uh, to, Cambodian, to Cambodia and, and Cambodian people. Um, Cambodia, as you probably know, suffered almost three decades of brutal civil war, including uh, the Khmer Rouge period from 1975 to 1979, when uh, an estimated two million people died from forced labor, forced labor, starvation, and execution. And those people who were targeted for execution and, 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 and for killing were the educated class. So in 1993, when the country had its first free election organized by the United Nations and a constitution, was implemented, a free press was, you know, was allowed. So we had the task at that, at that time of trying to help to rebuild the free press in Cambodia. And so that's my newspaper. But I'd like to put into context how Cambodia directly links to, the, to today's uh, conference in that you know, from uh, Watergate to WikiLeaks. You must remember before uh, Watergate there was the Pentagon Papers. And when Daniel Ellsberg leaked the, the, the Pentagon Papers, one of the, the kernels of information in there was the secret bombing of Cambodia. Um, during the late 1960s and beginning the 70s, the Nixon administration um, conducted a secret bombing campaign of Cambodia, which was you know, totally illegal. Cambodia was a neutral country at that time. But they doctored the flight plans of B-52s, and they dropped huge payloads 
of, 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 of uh, bombs over Cambodia to target what they said were you know, North and South Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese sanctu sanctuaries inside Cambodia. This killed an untold number of Cambodian villagers, tens of thousands, I presume, we, we expect. And not only, were, not only did it kill many civilians, it was totally illegal. The American public didn't know. Congress didn't know. Um, thanks to the leaking of these papers, this was later discovered. One of the effects of, of the illegal bombing of Cambodia was um, it radicalized the rural villagers and it drove them in many cases into the arms of the Khmer Rouge, which in then led to the terrible things that happened later on in the country. Um, you think, you know, that Cambo as Cambodia had suffered so much from these secrets of governments, you would think that, you know, the government now today would be more enlightened when it comes to government secrets, but in fact, it's uh, very much the opposite in Cambodia, where there is uh, no freedom of information acts or anything like it uh, in the country. Um, the constitution allows for free press, but at the same time, the work of journalists in Cambodia is very difficult. Um, around more than a, around a dozen journalists have been killed um, in, in Cambodia since 1994, and as far as I know, none of those cases have ever been solved. Um, Cambodia is a fledgling democracy, but oftentimes it's a stumbling democracy as well. And uh, it's a difficult place to work as a journalist. Violence, as I said, is common. Um, it's uh, a country where the court system is, 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 is compromised and that it's, it's, it's a highly politicized institution that works on behalf of, 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 of the government. And in recent years, the, the, the court system has been used quite actively and aggressively against journalists to try and stifle free speech. We have defamation laws which are criminal and can lead to prison sentences in Cambodia. And we also have a thing called uh, disinformation law. And uh, where many journalists are, 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 have been prosecuted under the law of, of spreading so-called disinformation. Um, last year, I know two journalists were arrested. One spent a year in prison, and another spent uh, maybe eight months. I believe since I've been here in, in, uh, in Cambridge, both of those, those journalists have since been released, which is, which is good news. But the fact is that many journalists do, do end up in prison for the stories they write. If the government decides they don't like what they've written, and they will move against them. I'm not going to focus too much on myself. Stephanie mentioned some things. I myself was arrested and detained briefly. And uh, most recently, I've been in the courts a couple of times. It was in 2009. I was uh, prosecuted for, for defamation. For, and along with my, one of my reporters for uh, printing the comments of an opposition member of parliament who had some critical remarks you know, in our newspaper about members of the military. And uh, for that, 22 generals took uh, lawsuits against us. And of course, we all lost. Um, now, as I said, there's no law, there's no freedom of information in Cambodia, but there are very strict laws about leaking information to journalists or anyone else. There's, there's strict laws on protecting government secrets and documents. But at the same time, in a country like Cambodia, we very often receive these documents from those few brave souls in the government who actually are, you know, the military the police force who actually think we're doing a job, and a good job in the, in the country, and they want to help further free speech. Um, as an example of of you know, freedom of information and what it can do. I want to use one example from our paper and what we've covered. And um, it's, it's when we got access to government uh, documents, it, wh wh how it helped shine light on a terrible chapter in, in Cambodia's recent history. In 1997, there was a, a grenade attack on a, a peaceful rally in Phnom Penh. The rally was against corruption in the, in the, in the judiciary. Um, a couple of hundred people had turned out on a Sunday morning. We were giving speeches, it was mainly women, garment factory workers, ordinary people, and uh, four grenades were lobbed into the middle of, of that, uh, that assembly, killing 16 people and injuring 120 other people. One of those people injured was an American uh, citizen. Therefore, the FBI was, was obligated to investigate uh, this, this, uh, this terrible atrocity in Cambodia. Uh, FBI agents were dispatched to Cambodia and began an investigation. Soon after they arrived, uh, newspaper reports emerged here and in Cambodia that the, invest the FBI investigation would be linking, had uh, uncovered information that linked members of the state security forces to the attack. Soon after that, the FBI pulled out. And uh, in, the, we, in, the, in the months and probably years afterwards, we were told that, in fact, the investigation was inconclusive. Two years ago, we began a uh, Freedom of Information Act request here in the US from Cambodia to have the FBI release to us all the documents of their investigation. And it was, a, it was my reporter, Douglas Gillison, I'll mention him here because it was a fantastic piece of work, that he began 
12 hour difference between Cambodia and the US. So he began his work at 11 p.m. at night after working the entire day in the office. And he would work into the early hours of the morning calling the di different departments in the US. It took two years, many, many um, uh, appeals upon appeals upon appeals to have information that was redacted, reinserted. They redacted such, name as, such names as Paul Pot from the official. <laughs> That's just to give you one example of what was redacted in the first versions. By the very end, after two years, we had thousands of pages of documents. And we, could, we stitched together, basically, what the FBI had found out. And indeed, I mean, it was no surprise to anyone in Cambodia. I mean, people, you know, wh where's the government keeps secrets from us? You know, the, the general public knows too well about what, what goes on in the country. But at least we could, we could release a, ser a series of feature stories detailing what the FBI had, had found out. And basically, at the end of the day, put the record straight. And again, it was, it was, it was what the FBI had investigators had found was that members of the state security service see, you know, seemed to be uh, witnesses had implicated them in the attack to the point where the attackers who were seen fleeing from the scene of the grenade attack were allowed through a police cordon, whereas those pursuing them were stopped, you know, details like that. So again, access to information, very important for us, and it's helped us in, in clearing up some chapters of, uh, of, of Cambodia's history. I mean, we don't have that in Cambodia, but anything that can help shine a light on government secrets. I mean, it, it's it's. I, I, as a journalist, I feel it's very welcome. You know, there's many of these uncomfortable truths governments want to keep from us, and it's our job to make sure we can we ferret them out and dig them out. And uh, that's all I really yeah, have to say. Well, if you think it's been cruel for me to put the three <coughs> of them up here to talk for ten minutes about all these complex things, it's the something four. that sorry, the four, four, four. The four of them. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> extra torture. Um, that's something that happens to you when you are a Neiman Fellow. You are your country, and you rarely have 10 minutes, actually, to explain it all. Um, it's also a very humbling experience, of course, to have all these courageous journalists in the mix every year as the world comes together in a nutshell in this building. Um, Stefan mentioned Holman Morris here from Colombia. He's here with Max from, from Russia. So, you know, we could have had 10 people up here just to show how important this is around the world. Let's start our discussion. Thanks, everybody. Um, Anna. Oh, and please identify yourself for the tape and the live stream. Sure. Anna Gorman, I'm a Neiman Fellow this year. You know, in America, as was talked about earlier, we go to the government and we say, we have a legal right to these documents, so you have to release them. So a question for, for Kevin, in, in a country where there are no laws granting information, how do you and your reporters trust the government for that, you know, in addition to waiting for leaks, how do you press the government for information? How do you convince them to give you anything? We don't. We, 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 we work around the edges. You know, we look at the cracks and try and work through lower secretaries or other, you know, officials who may have access to those documents and exert, you know, charm and pressure on those individuals, <laughs> you know? And appeal to, you know, their, their sense of you're doing the right thing if you give us that document, you know? But you can't, there's no pressure in the government, there's no law for them to release those documents. In fact, they're act actively trying to keep those documents from us. You know? I have a question about, uh, could, my could name you is Tom Blinkhorn, I'm a, I'm a former Neiman fellow, uh, older Neiman fellow, um, <laughs> uh, South Africa. Uh, an, uh, a prosecutor, uh, uh, a group of prosecutors called the Scorpions uh, may still be in existence root out corruption in uh, South Africa. Uh, what uh, relationship, if any, did your newspaper have with the Scorpions? Okay, well, uh, the Scorpions have been disbanded um, primarily because they investigate a lot of corruption involving a big arms deal, uh, which ultimately led back to the president. The president's financial advisor was, was put in prison, and the Scorpions were disbanded among, amongst much media hysteria, so justifiable media hysteria about the fact that this major crime-fighting organization that had a 92% conviction rate um, was disbanded, and a new organization called the Hawks was set up, which is different in tone and in leadership. Um, the, the Scorpions had a bit of a tormented relationship with the media. That's one of the reasons that, that they were uh, disbanded. People talked about the leaks to the newspapers, such as my newspaper. Um, and there were, there, were, there were a few incidents of off-the-record briefings that were used to justify this um, by prosecution's heads, which 
which is certainly arguable on both sides. Um, so we had quite good relationships generally with the prosecuting authorities. Um, but yet, I mean, it's a real pity that that, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was an overtly political decision to, to shut them down. It was a real tragedy for the country, I think, because they were seen as the public face of fighting corruption. Um, yeah, so, I mean, like all journalists, we have good relations. We try and have good relationships with prosecutors. Um, and often it's successful and often it's not. So, I mean, I'm sorry. Does that help at all? Thank you. Thanks. James Miller from the MIT Media Lab. Uh, I'd like to pick up um, a theme that several of you touched on, which is the international context of your work, and ask if you could speak uh, to some specific elements of that. For example, there are global media corporations, international human rights law, uh, Western media trainers, all in the mix. Mm -hmm. and could you talk about specific aspects of their influence or not <coughs> on your work? Um, I think that they have a good and bad um, influence. And, and the good thing is that uh, they are, are, are resource entities. And sometimes, especially in Latin America, that the, the, there is a high concentration of the print media. And print media is not doing investigative journalism. So the investigative journalism is uh, done by uh, alternative media or, or a new startups online, or, or I run a magazine for a year and a half and it failed uh, miserably without any ads. So we are poor. So we don't have resources, we don't have training, and, and most of the time uh, we are working on, on very low salaries. It's, so the existence of uh, international and global uh, entities that uh, help journalists, in, in, um, they are normally good uh, resources. They are also resources of, of, of getting information that we cannot get inside our country. But um, uh, um, uh, they are bad in the sense that they uh, um, portray a, a kind of a plain uh, vision of, of what journalists should be or don't understand the nuances of uh, uh, of every country and 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 most of the time um, um, there is this um, um, must do's that are based on practice in America that normally don't work in in an undeveloped country or don't work or, or assume for example that uh, pre media is the good guy and is and sometimes it's not. Or, or, or they don't understand that sometimes journalists also get corrupted, and sometimes the owners on, uh, or journalists are not up to journalism. So, Stefan, do you want to go there? No, I'm going to say that uh, <coughs> all the things that I uh, learned in the newsrooms working in, in Romania it was how not to do journalism. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> what I learned, I mean, the good things I learned, I learned through meeting foreign journalists and discussing with them and uh, freelancing for, for them. Of course, I got very strange uh, requests from, well, media groups like News of the World or MTV or uh, places like that. But also, I've got a really good collaboration with, uh, for example, ICAJ, and uh, they will speak about that, I, th I think. So it, it was a very Im important uh, working relationship. There is maybe a lot of uh, training that it's like done as a project paper around our region. Maybe that's not that helpful, but the working relationship with, with foreign uh, media and non-for-profit non uh, investigative journalists uh, was really helpful for me. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, you, you did a Freedom of Information Could you Act. just identify yourself? Oh, sorry. sorry for our views. Uh, I'm Florence Graves. I'm the founding director of the Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism <coughs> at Brandeis University. Uh, it's a nonprofit uh, newsroom, small, very small. When you filed your FOIA, did you find that there was any resistance because you were filing it from a foreign country? Well, and, and also, how difficult was it? Did, I mean, did you have to file lawsuits in order to get, you know, eventually after two years, or were you able to file the uh, pleas on your own? Well, I, I, think, I think the success that we had was down to the fact that it was, it was an American reporter on my staff. It was an American reporter on my staff who actually uh -huh. conducted the FOIA request. Mm -hmm. And I would be there when he was making the phone calls late at night, and he would have, yes, Cambodia. 
no, no, Cambodia. <laughs> because he's an American. And, right. and he built up relationships over years with individuals inside these departments. And he ground them down. I mean, it was just an unbelievable task on his part. When we started, I said, Douglas, you're on your own. I just, you know, I don't see how this, two years later, he delivered the goods. But it, it took. It was even difficult for us to get Yeah. Day, yeah, this was a daily process for two right. years. But I think it works for, I mean, we don't have the American guy or the Irish accent when we call <laughs> the people, but we used FOIA as well from Romania, and we used other databases and access, and we were not treated like, you know, you know from I'm another. I'm wondering, wouldn't it be interesting if you, someone got together and, in America, a nonprofit, and made FOIA requests for foreign-based, because yeah. you know what you want, and we're here. Just throwing that out. Yeah. That's <laughs> <very good information. laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Mabel Chan. I'm a visiting scholar at the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. This is a question for Kevin. Um, you mentioned earlier there are a few journalists who were killed for yes. the stories they published. I'm curious as to what kinds of stories were life-threatening, and how do you balance the risk to your to your staff uh, with the benefits to the public? Uh, you know, a lot of those journalists were killed before my time. I wasn't in Cambodia at that time. And uh, I don't know exactly you know, the, the exact stories that I'd written. It was more in the, in the, in the conduct of their work. They, you know, journalists are, are, are become victims of, of, of How violence. How currently, then, on your watch? I mean, do you see any sort of life-threatening, potentially life-threatening? Not for my staff. Okay. I'll tell you now, my staff have been, uh, have been very safe in all the years we've been, we've been publishing since 1993. Um, it's, lo it's usually local Khmer reporters for local newspapers. One of the problems with local newspapers is they're very politicized as well. They support one party or support another party. Mm -hmm. So they're already in the mix of politics influence, you know, even though they're, they're journalists, but they're still in the political realm. And so for, I warn my reporters, I said, when we remain impartial from this and we, we conduct professional journalism, which is our best protection, you know, mm -hmm. because we don't take sides with anyone. We're not spouting one, you know. Um, advocating on anyone's behalf, we're just journalists, you know, covering all sides. And um, again, and, and for that, because of professionalism, I believe it's protected us all these years, you know. I hope that's answered your question. <coughs> I'm Nick Ganilov of uh, Northeastern University. I'd like to try to get a, a brief comment from all four of you <laughs> on WikiLeaks. Sometimes it is said when a big event happens, is it good for the Jews or is it bad for the Jews? You know, I'd like to rephrase that by saying, is WikiLeaks good for journalism in your country or bad for journalism in your country? Will it encourage freedom or will it encourage reluctance to provide information? Should I start? I think it's a very good thing. And I can give you a short example. There's this guy in, in I mean, not for my country, but a neighboring country, Ukraine. There's this guy who's been investigated by reporters for the last 10 years, um, a broker of uh, gas, who received the intermediary position for Gazprom, shipping gas to Western Europe and other countries. And his links with the organized crime were suspected, but you know people reporting on that were immediately brought to court in the UK. And newspapers in Ukraine have no money to defend themselves in the UK. In UK. And in the cables, you can read his discussion with the American staff. He asked for this discussion, and he talks about these links with the organized crime. And he says that, yeah, we, I had to do this. I had to have these links with the organized crime. Actually, with w one of the uh, top ten most wanted people by the FBI, Semyon Mogilevich, because that was the way to do business in this region. So that's one, just one example, but there are a lot of examples like that. So I think I hope to see uh, people copying this around my region and, you know, to have Russian leaks or Chinese leaks or whatever. Um, I think in my country, uh, WikiLeaks have not provided too much information, but uh, like the president thing that um, uh, Christina uh, uh, Kitchener was um, unstable. That, I think that's, <laughs> that's the only piece of information. But uh, uh, I think the phenomenon has been good to journalism. Um, uh, because it, it has created a headline that doesn't come from El Mercurio, which is uh, the most traditional conservative newspaper, and it has been circulated around social networks. And, and that uh, has become a very good source of uh, uh, information um, outside 
some type of journalism has to lose prestige or, 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 or connection with the audience? Um, for, for my side, I, I mean, it, it hasn't been too much about my country that's been particularly entertaining. Um, in Zimbabwe, though, interestingly enough, I mean, Robert Mugabe has used some of the WikiLeaks cables as a vindication for his belief that his opponent's really weak. Um, so it's unfortunate that someone like that could use it. But I think it's more important the phenomenon, and I think the way the world reacts to it will determine how sources, the chilling effect on sources, and that could be particularly bad, a desire to root out sources. Um, but I think the debates around it are great. I mean, I think it it's puts forward the primacy of um, in the public interest defenses. I mean, that's something that people need to realize is, is outweighs um, nebulous notions of countries abusing the concept of um, you know, national security. Um, and another thing is, I think, the, um, the, the fact that it's the you know, journalists that are responsible and the responsibility of journalists to, to provide context, to provide, um, you know, to, to vet things before they put it out, has also been the primacy of that has been emphasized in this debate, which is a good thing. I'm pretty sure that if a lot of blogs got the WikiLeaks cables, they would have just put them all out on the web. I mean, I'm absolutely sure most blogs, well, a lot of blogs, would have just put all of it on the internet without thinking. And uh, so I think the importance of going through it, redacting certain things that you think are not in the public interest, I mean, it's good to, to, to you know, make that a primary focus again. We've had, I think so far, two or three stories that relate to Cambodia directly inside the cables. And again, like, if it's in the public interest, you know, it's our job to, 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 to publish. Again, we have to, we have to deal, that, deal, deal with such information in a professional, responsible manner, as you do with any information that comes to a newspaper. Um, on the issue of sources, I think it's one for you know the U.S. State Department, not really for us, because it'll have maybe you know an issue for their sources. I don't think it'll have any issue for our sources. Yeah. Nazila, uh, my question is for. Could Ken you identify yourself? Sorry. Yes, but sorry. I'm Nazila Fanti, current uh, media fellow. Um, what kind of information was it on the cables that you used? I went through the cables, uh, the ones that they were on Iran, very carefully, and there wasn't anything. <coughs> knew in it. I mean, most of it was diplomatic communication. Uh, some, of, some of it was even based on rumors, some of it. But basically, somebody who had some knowledge about Iran couldn't find anything new. Was there anything about Cambodia or any other country that had crucial information? Well, it was interesting. There's actually cables that came from uh, Singaporean diplomats talking about, I think, I forget who exactly in the Singaporean government, talking about their impressions of, of the Cambodian government and the role of you know, Vietnam, Laos, and Burma, and Cambodia inside ASEAN, which is you know, very telling, in fact, of what they actually really felt you know, beyond the, you know, the, the, the official decorum of their meetings, what they actually feel behind the scenes about each other. You know? And that's quite telling. You know? Yeah, I found it, it is. You know. I'm Leslie Johnson Downer. I'm an independent writer, and I just wanted to ask a question <coughs> again, um, to, uh, to everyone um, about the new media age angle of the complex topic, in particular the role of the English language, which is so intimately caught up with the whole question of that media age. Noticing that WikiLeaks and its publishing partners in different countries, like um, uh, the, the uh, everyone's mentioned, New York Times and Guardian, and then Der Spiegel, but also Le Monde and El País. These, these uh, papers all publish online editions in English, mm -hmm. and many other outlets around the world publish in English. And I wonder if you could say something about how language uh, works in this case. Uh, what kinds of decisions are, do you make about what you publish in uh, English or another language, in which instances? And what do you think, I was thinking Alejandro's point about judiciary systems in Chile, which systems people care about, where, where the ethics matter, and people have something invested that makes them want to talk to you. Um, do you need to choose the languages in which those people speak locally as well as a global language to talk about things that matter globally? Just wondering if you could say something about how language affects your work in that case. Um, I think in, a, in the case of El País, it's published in Spanish. Um, and, and, and I don't think it would be acceptable for them to publish in English because, uh, for example, in Chile, only 5% of the people speak, understand English, and I don't think that 5% of the people, uh, all of them speak uh, well, they somehow know English, and most of the population don't uh, don't uh, speak English, and and and, and the five percent of probably is correlated to the high uh, level income people. So um, I think a language is is is, is something a new uh, tool skill journalists should have 
because uh, uh, you are dealing with a world where the centers of power relate, communicates in English, but you need to translate that to your people. And, and, and of course, it's a, a responsibility because even if you give the documents to the Chilean population in English, they are not gonna, uh, it's, a, it's a second barrier to, to make sense of the information. So it's, it's a, a, an additional challenge to journalism and uh, to try to make sense of what's going on in the world. We publish all our national news in Khmer and are the leading international stories of the day. So, so we, we publish <laughs> everything in Romanian. And we have as a policy to translate everything in English and for some projects in Russian. El Pais has, though, it's been interesting, they have this uh, browsable map where you can click on each country and sort of get a look at the cables. Everything is in Spanish until you get to the actual cable, and then the cable is in English. Mm. In Germany, actually, there has been within the past five years a huge trend for all the major papers to also have abbreviated, but by now quite elaborated English language editions, so Der Spiegel, Der Stern, Die Zeit, and so forth do have some of their publications in English. So, just as a Richard, just one more question. Uh, Richard Lisbon, a, a Neiman affiliate. Rob, I was struck by your comment that if bloggers had got hold of the cables, they might have just put them all out for everybody to see. Um, can you explain a bit why you think that is wrong? And who, in this case, then, should be the designated gatekeeper? Um, well, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying it's, I, I just think that's actually what would have happened. I think a lot of blogs, um, it's more important to have people read your, come to your website. It's more important to develop your brand than to display responsible journalism. That's a huge, that's a huge generalization. And I think and it's clearly not true amongst the top, you know, the, the better known blogs. Um, but I just think in general, um, that's, that's a more important prerogative for a lot of people. Um, I, I do think that context is crucial in, in, in these kind of, in, in decoding these cables and just putting it out and seeing what would not be responsible, what would not be in the public interest. Um, I mean, clearly, the, the public interest argument, I think, should hold sway. And if it doesn't meet that, um, and I think the journalists, part of the, pro I mean, you're trained as a journalist, you, you, you have a certain professionalism that you're aware of, and you don't need, people who aren't journalists, bloggers, have a certain professionalism as well, and they know this. And, and you know, I don't think it's, it's across the board that that would have happened, but I do think in some cases, some people would absolutely have done that. Unaware of the, unaware of the consequences, perhaps. I think we're going to have to wrap up now. Let's give a round of applause to our... <laughs>